The third lecture for uh, chapter 25, we're going to continue our story about how urine is formed in the kidneys. So uh, the last video lecture, I mentioned that there were three key steps to urine formation. One of those is glomerular filtration. So we talked about that in the last video lecture. That's where water and most solutes get squeezed out of the blood that's passing through the glomeruli in the kidneys and that filtered fluid with all those solutes in there gets captured inside the glomerular capsules. So those are the structures that are receiving that filtrate. Uh, the rest of urine formation involves uh, two key processes. One is reabsorbing the good stuff, things that the body needs to hang on to, like glucose and amino acids and various uh, electrolytes. And secretion, this is where additional waste substances or things that the body needs to excrete um, can be added to the developing urine as it's passing through these nephrons in the kidneys. All right, so again, reabsorption, if we're thinking about one of these nephron structures. So if you've got your renal corpuscle here, where the uh, that consists of the glomerular capsule with the glomerulus inside. And then that leads to a proximal convoluted tubule. Convoluted meaning it's going all over the place, and kind of wiggly. That's your PCT, or proximal convoluted tubule. That leads to the loop of Henle, or the nephron loop, over here. And then that leads to a distal convoluted tubule. Which is the part of the nephron that also looks wiggly. Distal here and proximal. Proximal means you're closer to the glomerulus. Uh, distal means you're located further away from the glomerulus. And then that's going to connect into a collecting duct. So that's going to be a CD, we'll call it, or a collecting duct. All right, so our urine is going to be, our developing urine is going to be flowing like this through this these structures and reabsorption is where you reclaim substances out of the proximal convoluted tubule loop of Henle distal convoluted tubule or the collecting duct okay before you get to the renal pelvis and the ureters which are going to take that uh, urine that is formed down to the bladder for storage. So we got to reclaim or reabsorb these substances before all of that happens. All right, so right over in here, your proximal convoluted tubule. Uh, this is where most, this very first part of a nephron, this is where most reabsorption takes place. So most of your sodium ions, for example, you know, we've talked about how important sodium uh, absorption is. Remember aldosterone, that hormone produced by the adrenal cortex, we talked about how it goes to the kidneys and it tells the kidneys to reclaim more sodium ions. So this is where this is happening. Aldosterone is telling these proximal, these structures in the kidneys to take the sodium ions out of the developing urine and return them to the tissue fluids and the blood. Also a lot of water gets reabsorbed here. Um, all of your nutrients, so things like glucose, amino acids, for example, those are going to move out of those tubules and back into the surrounding tissue fluids and then from there back into the bloodstream. Remember, fluids move from compartment to compartment in the body. That's a very important concept that you guys should not forget uh, because it will rear its head for you again uh, when you move into uh, nursing school or other clinical programs. Um, other ions, sodium's an ion, but many other things are as well, like potassium and calcium and so forth. Um, small proteins, now we just said you're not going to have, most proteins don't come out of the blood, but small ones, little smaller chains of amino acids uh, can move out and they can be reclaimed as well. Oops, I just got rid of my drawing there. The loop of Henle, though, the part of the nephron that hangs down. We're going to talk about that's one of the major sites of, that's the main site of urine 
concentration. So we'll, we're going to see how that works. And uh, the descending limb, that's the part that's connected to the proximal convoluted tubule up here. Uh, lots of water moves back into the tissues and out of the descending limb. And over here on the ascending limb, you're going to have sodium and potassium and chloride ions moving out of the ascending limb and into the surrounding tissue fluids. And we'll talk more about that. That's important for uh, urine concentration and how all that works. So we'll cover that in a separate video lecture. And then finally, when you get up here to this distal convoluted tubule, if you haven't watched the anatomy video lecture for the urinary system, you need to do so because a lot of the terminology here I'm using, I'm assuming that you've already seen that. In the distal convoluting tubule and the collecting duct over here, uh, their reabsorption is hormonally regulated. For example, calcium, remember uh, parathyroid hormone, you studied that hopefully in Biology 201 and you certainly studied it in this class when we covered the endocrine system. Uh, one of the things that PTH does, PTH tries to increase the calcium ion levels in your body fluids. Calcium homeostasis is absolutely crucial for bodily functions. So one of the things that PTH can do is it can tell cells in the distal convoluted tubule within the walls of the tubule transport calcium out of the developing urine and back into tissue fluids. Uh, ADH, antidiuretic hormone. Um, we'll talk more about how that works. It really acts on, especially on the collecting ducts over here. As urine is passing through a collecting duct, uh, ADH triggers um, an increased reclaiming of the water back out of the developing urine and into the surrounding tissues. And sodium ions, remember aldosterone and uh, ANP can impact, atrial natriuretic peptide can impact uh, sodium ion levels. And this is where aldosterone works. It tells the cells that are lining uh, these structures to reclaim sodium out of the developing urine and return it to the surrounding tissue fluids. Okay, the tubular secretion process works in reverse. It's reabsorption in reverse. And uh, it can be, you have to kind of think about it because some of the terminology here can be a little bit difficult to get used to at first, uh, but secretion means out of your body fluids and into the urine, whereas reabsorption is from urine to body fluids. You just have to kind of commit that to memory. So there are things that can be added to the urine. So this adds substances to the, to the urine after filtration. So sometimes adjustments to things like your potassium levels, hydrogen ion levels, those influence pH. Uh, NH4, that's ammonium. Those are ammonium ions. Uh, those have to be controlled. They, they um, impact your pH. Uh, creatinine is a waste of the skeletal muscle, muscle system. Remember your creatine phosphate in your skeletal muscles that uh, helps you store energy for muscle contractions. Creatinine is a waste product of that. Um, various organic acids like lactic acid for example that's also generated from uh, by your skeletal muscles during intense exercise. Those are things that can um, move out of the peritubular capillary. So those are the blood vessels that are surrounding the nephron structures. Um, these substances can move out of those capillaries into the surrounding tissue fluids and then immediately move across the tubule cells. Those are the cells that line the tubules and then into the filtrate. So that is tubular secretion. Um, tubular secretion can also dispose 
some substances that are attached to plasma proteins. Plasma proteins are uh, sometimes transport various substances around in the blood. They, they basically uh, hitchhike or hitch a ride on these proteins and there are some plasma proteins that will discard those substances through this process. Tubular secretion can also eliminate undesirable waste substances. Urea is a uh, waste from protein catabolism. Remember, catabolism is where you break things down. So one waste, uh, urea is a waste product that's generated from that. And uric acid is a waste of nucleic acid, DNA and RNA catabolism. When those kinds of molecules are broken down, uh, one of the waste products is uric acid. Tubular secretion also helps you control your potassium levels. Those have to be carefully maintained for, for homeostasis. I'm going to erase all this because it's getting kind of messy. And I'm waiting for my screen to respond. Okay. Uh, then also, uh, get at the end of this, uh, this part of Unit 5, we're going to talk about controlling body fluid pH. We already know how critical that is. And this process, this secretion process, can help control that by altering the levels of hydrogen ions. Remember, pH is actually a measurement of how concentrated those are in your body fluids. pH is a measurement of how concentrated hydrogen ions are in your body fluids. And also, through HCO3 with a negative charge, that's a bicarbonate ion. If you remember that from when, when we covered the respiratory system. That's part of that whole CO2 plus water goes to carbonic acid, goes to hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. I mentioned that was going to be uh, rearing its head again when we got to the to the kidney part of the course. And um, yes, at the end of this chapter we'll be talking a lot about how the levels of bicarbonate ions also can play a very important role in controlling blood and body fluid pH. Here's a diagram from your textbook, which is pretty good because it again is showing you what I was drawing on the previous figure. And so you can look through here. You don't really, you don't need to memorize everything that gets reabsorbed and where, but this is a pretty good diagram. I do want you guys to, to remember that your major nutrients like glucose and amino acids most of your sodium and most of your water gets reabsorbed here. This is the proximal convoluted tubule. And then we'll be talking about what you see here with water moving out of the descending arm of the nephron loop and these ions moving um, out along the ascending arm. We'll be talking about that in a later lecture. And I do want you guys to know where things like aldosterone and parathyroid hormone and your uh, antidiuretic hormone functions on the collecting ducts and the distal convoluted tubule over here. So I do want you guys to keep those things in mind as well as we go through the rest of the unit. But this is a pretty good diagram here which is showing you not only reabsorption in blue but also secretion in green. So those are the substances that are moving into the urine as it's passing through these structures during your urine formation. All right, so I mentioned that, uh, so we've covered those three processes of urine formation. Your textbook is going into a lot more detail, so I am actually trimming the information quite a bit down here for chapter 25, believe it or not. And I mentioned that this glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, is key. Uh, that has to be regulated. It's very important for that to be regulated properly to make sure you are removing wastes as needed, reclaiming substances as needed. But that's also uh, the glomerular filtration rate is going to play an important role in um, blood pressure control as well. And so we're going to talk about that there are intrinsic controls of glomerular filtration rate. That means things that the kidneys do automatically and then there are extrinsic controls. Extrinsic means from the outside. 
So you have influences by things like the nervous system that uh, impact glomerular filtration rate as well. So we'll talk about those on the next two video lectures.